Good evening and thank you for tuning in tonight. I am New York City Councilman Chaim Deitch and you're listening to Chaim on the Radio. I'm live here in the studio tonight, joined by my social distance co-host, Dr. Faye Zakheim, and we are filling in tonight for Zeb Brenner on TalkLine Communications Network. Good evening, Faye. Hi, Councilman. How are you? Good evening. I saw this uh, flyer that's going around. It's called Virtual Activities for Holocaust Survivors, and that's amazing. So tell, tell me a little bit of how that works. Well, let me first start by saying, Councilman, that the only reason that we are able to do a program like that is because of you. So thank you so much. So the way the program works, it's amazing. We were so worried about our Holocaust survivors because they're locked in. They're not coming out. Soon, soon they will come out. But right now they're not. And um, what we decided to do was to create something where even though they are at home, they can be part of a program. So we got 10 iPads that will work automatically, and a volunteer will go in, a volunteer who is COVID-free and has been tested, will go into 10 of the Holocaust survivors' houses. In addition to that, there are um, two groups of Holocaust survivors that have been meeting over the past couple of weeks in a socially distant environment, so they're together. And they will also be part of this program. And they're all going to be playing bingo. Wow. They're actually going to be playing bingo with each other. And, Councilman, we wanted to know if you could join and call out some of the bingo numbers. Um, yeah, why not? I'd love to join. I love bingo. I haven't played bingo in maybe 30 years. <laughs> it's it's going to be really exciting. Yeah. And they'll be competing with each other. That's, so we're super, that's super excited. truly amazing. And this is they're like a model. They're going to be interacting again. So the last time they were together, Councilman was when we were with them at the pottery place, when they were doing pottery. Yeah, on Coney Island Avenue. And now we'll be together again playing bing- on Coney Island Avenue, yeah. And this is, and really, this, this is uh, Faggy, this is like a model that other people could, um, you know, senior centers, uh, people that um, run senior centers, because we all know the senior centers are closed. And seniors are sitting at home, and, you know, this gives them something to do. This is, like, truly amazing. And uh, this should be a model for other people to follow. Uh, and yeah, the nice thing about it is that the reason we could get something like this done is because all the agencies that work with Holocaust survivors, they all work together. Everybody has one thing in mind. They all want the Holocaust survivors to be okay and to come out of this COVID time in a happy kind of way. And because of all the agencies on the United Task Force working together as a coalition, that's why they are able to do programs like this. Thanks to the help of Councilman Dyke. For all his help with the Holocaust survivors. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Thank you for everything you do, uh, Faye. Um, You know, tonight we're going to be speaking again about uh, homelessness uh, here in the city of New York. And we all know that the mayor has came up with this initiative back in 2017. Uh, It's called Turning the Tide where the administration plans on opening 90 new shelters citywide. Uh, and, you know, this is something that has been, you know, different members in the city council, different people in communities are really, like, questioning, is this the right thing to do? You have a plan back in 2017. Now it's 2021. Times have changed. We're in a pandemic. And, you know, we have to revisit the way we uh, house homeless people because the fact is, I have to tell you, Dr. Faye, if you walk out in the street and you see a um, homeless person and sleeping in the street and you approach that person, you, say, you, you ask them, do you need shelter? Do you want shelter? Do you want to go into a homeless shelter? One of the first things they tell you is no. It's very difficult to get a person who's living in the street into a shelter. And one of the first things they say No, I don't feel safe there. And if a person who has been in the shelter system and who is now living back in the street doesn't feel safe in a shelter, um, how do you expect a surrounding community that has one of these 90 shelters, how are they supposed to feel um, when they question that, are my children safe walking to school, going and coming from school? Are we safe going and coming from school? But we have to realize that these people are human beings, and we need to make sure that if they go into shelters, they they don't go back out in the street. Um, as the chair of veterans, there is this amazing um, non-for-profit. It's called Jericho Project, 
and they have supportive housing for veterans who are homeless. And I actually get phone calls from homeless veterans trying to get into that shelter because that ha- that is how good it is, that those supportive housing shelters. And those are also more like permanent housing, many of them. So we want people to come ask us to go into a shelter where they feel comfortable. So I think permanent housing is the way to go with supportive services and and not to have these 90 shelters being put up all over the city where we see that this has failed. This has failed the homeless population. So we're going to be speaking about uh, one of the homeless shelters, that um, one of these 90 homeless shelters, uh, part of the May's initiative from back in 2017, is coming into my district. And I don't want the mayor to tell me, to tell my constituents what is good for our district, for our community, and what is good for the homeless community when we disagree and we see that those homeless shelters have failed the people. And we're going to have a very special guest tonight joining us in the radio program. And uh, so I want to tell all my listeners uh, to stay tuned. And the call-in number here in the studio, uh, if you have any questions or comments, p- please feel free to call in. The call-in number is 718-303-9090. We're going to try to take some calls throughout the program. We are going to take a commercial break, and we'll be right back. TalkLine Network Radio, America's longest-running Jewish broadcast network, the voice of the Jewish community. And now your host... Welcome back, and you're listening to Chaim in the Radio, 620 on your AM dial. You're listening to Talk Line Communications Network, and I'm here live in the studio with my co-host, uh, social distance co-host, Dr. Faye Zakheim. Tonight, we are going to c- continue our conversation from last week about homelessness. Last week, we discussed the shelter that made de Blasio wants to build in our district, and we talked about the environmental impacts of the particular site chosen, in uh, which is... Um, in Brighton Beach, but if you walk two blocks in one, one, one location, you'll end up in Brighton Beach. Two blocks another way, you're going to end up in Manhattan Beach. And two blocks another direction, you're going to end up in Sheep's Bay. So it really impacts uh, three different communities by having the shelter site in, in our district. We also discussed some of the problems in the shelter system in general and spoke about the importance of focusing on permanent housing instead of the cycle of constantly opening new shelters. And, you know, these shelters are basically congregate shelters where you you may have anywhere between 14 and 17 people per room. It doesn't give the people in these shelters independence. It doesn't give, you don't have enough services. And, um, you know, to continue uh, the discussion about shelters, I invited my colleague and friend, New York City Councilman Steve Levin, to join us on the show tonight. And Councilman Levin represents the 33rd District in Brooklyn, which includes the neighborhoods of Williamsburg, Greenpoint, Brooklyn, and Brooklyn Heights. He also serves as the chairman of the New York City Council's General Welfare Committee that has oversight on the Department of Homeless Services. So welcome, Council Member Levin. Thank you so much. I am. It's nice to be with you. Uh, I consider you a good friend, and it's um, glad to be on your show. It's always it's always great to have you here, and I also invited another guest with us to join us tonight, and uh, some of our longtime listeners might remember Reverend Kevin McCall. Uh, I call him Ref Kev, as he is known, uh, and he's a community activist and organizer. As a prominent leader in the African-American community, Ref Kev is here to offer his perspective as well on the in- inequities in the shelter system and uh, to discuss the proposal here in Brighton Beach. And uh, Ref Kev, thank you for being on the air tonight. Thank you for having me, uh, Councilman. I appreciate it. That's the first time I heard you call me Councilman. It's usually Chaim, and you, and, you do, and, you do, and you do that pretty well. I called you Rabbi earlier, right? <laughs> yes, you did. And how are you, Councilman Midlibbon? Very good, Reverend. Nice to be with you. So, you know, I want to discuss and I want to hear the perspective. Um, Councilman Levin, your view as the chair of the General Welfare Committee in the City Council, and you had many hearings about uh, this ho- homeless shelters, uh, congregate homeless shelters that um, the mayor has initiated, and 
you see them popping up all across the city. And I mentioned, as I mentioned before, that from speaking to people who are living in the street, and we all have that passion, we don't want people living in the street. But these shelters, to me, have not proven to be effective. I want to hear your view of the shelter systems, and uh, we discuss permanent and supportive housing, and that is the key to keep people in their homes, to keep people in housing. So let me hear your perspective of uh, the homeless uh, shelter initiative that the mayor has uh, rolled out back in 2017. Um, so you kind of you, you said something that was very um, uh, insightful uh, earlier, Haim. You said that when you talk to somebody who's homeless on the street and ask them if they want to go into shelter, they'll say that they don't want to go because they don't feel safe. That's that's a, a refrain that you'll hear uh, over and over again, and it's true. And so when somebody is sleeping on the street, um, uh, one thing that we that is, is pretty clear is that it's not as if they don't know that there are shelters available. And they know also that they have a right to shelter. They can walk in uh, to 30th Street Intake, on uh, 30th Street in Manhattan at Bellevue, and um, and they can get shelter that night. Um, the reality is that people feel safer sleeping outside um, than they do in a congregate setting like you described, where there's 14 or uh, 18 people in a room. Um and now there are models of shelter that don't use that. Um, and this is for single adults. There's a whole family shelter system that's a different system, um, also run by Department of Health Services. But if we're just talking about single adults right now, then um, there are these alternatives to that. They're called safe havens, um, and, there are, and there are also stabilization beds. Those are rooms that are rented out by um, by the city in hotels or in um, SROs, which is kind of a rapidly um, defining housing resource. So that back, you know, 40 years ago, there were a lot of uh, single-room occupancy SROs, for, mostly for single adults who um, don't have a lot of income. And, um, and that's one reason why we don't actually have, why the permanent housing is so difficult to file. But um, safe havens and stabilization beds give people some semblance of privacy. They might have a single roommate. They might have their own room. And there are support services on site. Um, what, what the city has done is because that's more, a more expensive model um, to provide, the city has um, makes it really difficult for somebody to get into a safe haven or a stabilization bed. They have to be seen more than three times for longer than nine months. It has to be documented, and they have to be in the same place, basically. And it's, it is, it, it, you know, they really are, uh, have people jump over hurdles to be able to get into the type of, just this type of shelter that is um, suitable um, because, they, because they haven't really built out the infrastructure. So just, you know, uh, a couple weeks ago, the city approached me and said, we want to put a safe haven in your district. And my response was, that's great. I'll take it because um, because it, if it's a safe haven, it means that it's going to come up with good services. Um, the provider is a good provider. It's a great new brand. And, and so we could do this in a way that then gets people on track to permanent housing. There's supportive housing that you mentioned before, Haim, that is a, a key component to being able to get people out of the shelter system into permanent housing. But not everybody can qualify for supportive housing. You have to have a demonstrated um, psychological need. Um, you know, Steve, last uh, week sure. last, last week I went to uh, one of the core providers' um, shelters, and a core told me and the DHS told me, Look, you could go visit, um, we could do a site visit to two of our shelters, and you will see how CORE, who is the provider, how they run it, and you'll see how beautiful it is. And it's nice and clean, and everything is great, and people are happy. So I, I told them, yeah, of course, I'll take you on the offer to do a site visit. But I know that when you arrange a site visit, 
right? They clean the place. They speak to the people before. They make sure when you come in, everything looks good. Maybe they ask people to leave, those who complain. I don't know what they do, but I know that they really spiff up the whole place. And our site visit was scheduled for Tuesday, uh, this past Tuesday. I decided on Martin Luther King Day that I'm going to go down there and I'm going to surprise them. I didn't go in because mm-hmm. of COVID, but I stood outside for four hours speaking to people going and coming into the shelter. And one person told me that he's been he's been living there for more than a year. So he's living in the shelter for more than a year, which is unacceptable because these shelters actually are supposed to be like more of a transitional shelter. You go in there for maybe up to a year, and then you're supposed to go into permanent housing. And that was very disturbing. And number two, um, they're, they're supposed to have 140, according to their website, 140 individuals at the shelter. A second person told me, there was only 40 uh, because they moved other people around, I guess, because of COVID. And you, right. you, you couldn't really see the impact of what goes on there because you only have 40 people there. And I still saw people coming, walking in and out. And I spoke to another individual who told me he wants a job. There's no employment services. Uh, they don't have yeah. activities. Um, the, the television room, they have a room where they have a television. They said they don't allow us to sit there and watch television because of COVID. So I asked them, but you have 14 people in the room. I asked them, do you have a television in your room? They said no. So I asked them, what do you do all day? Well, I walk in, I walk out, I walk in. So you couldn't really see the impact because it is cold outside. It's not during the summer where you see what's really going on. So people have concerns. I have concerns about how they are housing those people in those shelters. Yeah, I mean, for the time being, by the way, um, about two thirds of um, of the single adult shelter population. So there's the seventeen thousand people, uh, single adults that are in shelter. Probably another three or four thousand people that are sleeping on the street in New York City. Um, over ten thousand of the of single adults in shelter are actually in hotel rooms right now. Um, that's something that I worked on a lot over the spring. Uh, and that's just because of COVID. That's a temporary placement because of COVID. Um, and uh, FEMA, the federal government, pays for 70 or 75 percent of the cost of that. So the city taxpayers are not paying, um, you know, an, an exorbitant amount of money for that. And what it's done, um, data just came out this week that showed um, that 100 and um, in fact, I think 120 uh, people uh, in shelter have died from COVID, or 108 people in shelter have died from COVID, um, and um, 100 of one of 101 of them was just between the months of April and June. So once once this program got up and running in the summer, it really has saved lives. Now it's temporary because it's only going to last as long as the funding from FEMA is available. And that's tied to the, to the state of emergency declaration. Yeah, and you know but, uh, an, another factor, um, Steve, is that you know when you when we talk about homeless shelters, the bulk of the money comes from the city. Uh, that, that's what I was told. The city pays for that. Yes. When, when we speak that's about important. and when we talk about permanent housing, um, the bulk yeah. of the money comes from the state. So why is the city spending money when we're in a deficit on something that is proven not to work? when we could get the money from the state and the federal government to have them in permanent housing. I, I had a site visit with Commissioner Banks, the Commissioner of uh, the Department of Homeless Services, that's for our listeners to know, and I took him out to the boardwalk, which is not even my district, it's my colleague's district, where you have dozens of homeless people just on the boardwalk, sleeping there, drinking, mm-hmm. and, and I said, we need to do something, let's get something done. This is six years ago, I haven't heard back from him in regards to a solid plan. And and, and, I, and and these things are very disturbing. And to get to get so there's the the state funding uh, is available through supportive housing. The city also has its own supportive housing program. You know they 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 both are doing and kind of competing um, supportive housing programs. But one thing that we that we there's a couple things um, you mentioned the how long people are staying in shelter. People are staying in shelter for a year, year and a half, two years. Um, the average length of stay is, is well over a year. And the problem that, that is, is that it's, it's hard to find an apartment. So if you can, if you have a, a documented, um, psychological reason, you can get into supportive housing. But if you don't, 
And there are a lot of people, a lot of single adults who are who don't have any mental health issues. They're just they don't have enough income to be able to find, uh, stay in an apartment in New York City, um, and they end up in shelter. For those individuals, the the options are really limited. There's um, because we don't have SROs like we used to, have, and we used to, you know, with these call them flop houses or, or SROs, where you know it's a Shared bathrooms often, but but um, but some some privacy and a low rent, um, you know, uh, four or five hundred dollars a month maybe, uh, which people can really afford, you know. But it's um, you can you can pay it on a pension and social security, but but we don't have that anymore. So that's one big challenge. The other challenge is that we have a voucher that we give people. Um, you say, okay, it's called the City Fest voucher. You say, okay, here's your voucher. This will help pay for your apartment. Whatever your income is, you pay a third of that. The rest of the rent will be covered by this voucher. Problem is that those vouchers are there. They only pay eighty percent of fair market rent. And so people are walking around with these vouchers for a year, two years, not being able to find an apartment because the apartment is that it's the the apartments are always higher rent than the voucher will pay for. So that's one actually piece of legislation. I'm glad that you're co-sponsoring it that I'm working on um, to get that the city to, to up the amount of the voucher so at least people can have a fighting chance of getting an apartment. Um, but it's it's been very frustrating, and this is one thing they fought us tooth and nail on. They fought us tooth and nail because they don't want to pay for it. Meanwhile, we know it costs about three times as much to keep somebody in shelter for a month. Yeah, we, we spoke about uh, we spoke about a five thousand dollars per person who was in shelter, and we all know yeah. that tens tens of thousands of New Yorkers moved out of New York, and I'm not going to name actually, yeah, because of the governor and the mayor. I don't know if you can say that, but you have tens of thousands of vacant apartments where um, I just read an article just a few weeks ago, which is under market rate, so they could get an apartment for two thousand dollars and house um, people in there with and and send services there. Temporarily until they they put them in permanent housing, and I want to ask Revkev. We have Revkev on the on the air, and I have a question for you, Revkev. You know, you are like very well known in the community, and you're always out in the streets. You always speak to people. You're very caring. So if if homeless individuals were actually consulted by the powers that be, what do you think would be? What do you think they would want to see um, improved? Well. The first problem that it is within the city and some of the stuff that Councilman Lever and you touched on already, but we fought tooth and nail in Brownsville in the East New York, uh, and we built some coalitions around the uh, housing homeless issues that was happening in the city because the mayor wanted to implement the shelters in East New York, and he wanted to put them by uh, churches and want to put them by t- uh, homes that have been there for for years. And we fought him two for nail on it, and we got him to be able to place it somewhere else. But that's not Ref Kev, you're the hired. solution. You're hired. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the solution to the problem because all you're doing is chasing your own tail because that goes to another community uh, and that community now has to fight. And if they don't have that much power and that much people power, then the shelter stays. But this is a problem that both of y'all have been facing in the city council under the leadership of Bill de Blasio. Uh, and that's why it's important to elect someone, uh, the next mayor, that has a plan that knows what it is to understand the issues of homelessness and what is in the face of it. New York City has been, Mayor de Blasio has been sued for children and students in shelters that don't even have Wi-Fi, that can't even get on their tap to get their education. Uh, and it was a lawsuit that was uh, by the uh, Coalition for the Homeless and some students experiencing homelessness uh, because of the simple fact that they can't even get on uh, uh, virtual learning. Uh, they don't have an iPad, and those we had to fight for that during the pandemic. Then they have, they got their iPad, but then they don't have Wi-Fi. Uh, so this was a problem way before pandemic, 
So you can't blame the pandemic on it. This is a problem that has been affected in New York City. When you're talking about individuals who are homeless, yes, they don't want to go in the shelter for a number of reasons. One of the particular reasons is because there's no lifeline uh, in terms of expectancy inside the shelter. You could be in the shelter for two, three years, uh, and there's nothing, and you can have a voucher, like you talked about, Council 11, you can have a voucher, and the voucher you've been depending on landlords uh, to be able to find you and relatives to be able to help you find an apartment. But even in the pandemic, these landlords are not even accepting those particular programs. So it's, it's a catch-22 when you're dealing with someone that's, that is in homeless and those they, they have these particular issues. So it's important for them to be able to have a particular plan when you're dealing with this homeless people. It, people say that, you know, New York City is the big apple, you know, all the lights at Times Square, and they've been dealing with this in other neighborhoods, and uh, homelessness is affected, and people are leaving New York City because they're saying they're going to crazy because the mayor don't have a plan. That's why I'm supporting the blue plan that the New York Housing Conference put together uh, to invest $4 billion per year to fund uh, affordable housing plans and also to appoint a single deputy mayor that's in charge of linking housing to homelessness in City Hall and also to create a flexible rental subsidy for at least $2 million per year to match by New York State in the federal government, and also to create a, a racial equity strategy that begins to reverse centuries of racist, racist house, housing policies that currently exist. So if you deal with the core of the problem, could we be written to vent the bill? You can get rid of homelessness when you have effective housing, when you have people that are uh, in housing and they're going from housing, from, from a shelter, and their timeline is very short, and they get into housing. How can you expect someone to be able to go into a shelter when they leaving the shelter, going into a rat-infested New York City Housing Authority apartment? Ref Kev, they going if, from, Ref Kev, if, from you, if you run for mayor, you got my vote. And I, I just, <laughs> you got my vote. And I just want to tell you, um, Ref Kev, I'm, I'm hoping to have a press conference about this particular shelter, and I'm hoping you could join us. Um, I'm looking to do it within the next uh, over the next week. Um, I have a question. The phones, here, the phone lines are ringing here off the hook. I want to take some callers, some questions from callers or comments. But I, I want to touch upon one thing that Rev Kev mentioned. You mentioned that you hope the next mayor has a a plan, a plan in place, not like the current mayor. Now, what disturbs me is that when the city now is signing leases for many of these homeless shelters with only 11 months left for this mayor to be in office, now they are tying the hands of the next mayor that's coming in on these leases that he signed, that he's having a DHS sign with providers for at least, at least four years. So if the next mayor has to break leases that this mayor is signing now, it's going to cost the city millions of dollars. And well, they don't need to break the lease. They just need to appoint a deputy mayor that could be in charge of the uh, housing and homelessness policies that's in place already. And they can be able to make sure that these shelters are run correctly and that they have a, over uh, uh, a rate where people are leaving the particular place. It should look like the same place in a year. You should go back to that same place on that same day and see that same person that was in the year year already into a new apartment. That's what the new mayor should look like. Yeah, and they they have to do they they would have to do major construction. You're absolutely right, right, Reverend, that that there's a structural problem within City Hall and that's that homeless policy is under is under the deputy mayor of, of health and human services. And there's another mayor that does housing and economic development and they don't they don't really communicate with one another. And so the policies are never lined up. And that's why we have affordable housing, you know, in air quotes, affordable housing that's for people making $90,000 a year, um, but no affordable housing for people making $30,000 or $20,000. Yeah, that sounds just like the governor and the mayor. 
how they how they work together. Um, let's take some calls. Let's get let's get some callers in the, on the air. Hi, you're live on the air. Hi. Uh, I have a question. I have a question for Council Member Levin. Hello. My, yeah, hi. My name is Ida Sanoff, and I was on uh, a Zoom meeting last night about the proposed shelter that Councilman Deutsch uh, mentioned in Brighton Beach here in Brooklyn. And my question yeah. concerns the cost to taxpayers of constructing these shelters. Uh, we learned last night that this shelter is going to be built on top of a brownfield. Now, we know in New York City, brownfields can be remediated. Uh, many luxury buildings are built on top of brownfields. But this is an expensive mm-hmm. process. You have to hire a consultant. You have to do all sorts of studies. You have to do a cleanup. It can cost between hundreds of thousands to a couple of million bucks. Well, at any rate, this shelter that's proposed for this area is to be built on a brownfield, and we were told that the developer will pay the costs of the cleanup. Now, number one, this is the first time I've ever heard the word developer mentioned in context with a homeless shelter, and it's economic 101. If the if someone is paying more to clean up this property, then that cost is going to ultimately be passed on to the buyer, who in this case is the city of New York who's going to be constructing a shelter. So I would like to know how the city is justifying, and this is not the first shelter that we've heard of being built on a former brownfield. So I would like Mm -hmm. to know how the city justifies paying more to purchase a cleaned-up brownfield than they would to purchase a comparable property that would not require a cleanup. Well, I don't know the economics of, I mean, all the economics exactly of this of this proposal, but um, but you're right. If somebody is, is a quote unquote developer, then they will be recouping their cost. They have they're going to not going to go through with it if it wasn't profitable for them. Um, taking a big step back about. Um, why they're building new shelters right now is that um, for a long time the quality of shelters, and this is really, you know, Bloomberg was able to skate um, uh, by when it came to homelessness. And, you know, in the last five or six years of his term, he, he kind of held it together with scotch tape and bubble gum. Like it was, it was not, it was not a really functional system. And so when de Blasio came in, a lot of it came kind of crashing down. There's a lot of controversy around um, bad uh, uh, facilities. Um, there was, um, you know, there was all types of problems with the shelter population growing rapidly. When I took over as chair, the budget for homeless services was about a mm-hmm. billion dollars. It's about $2 billion now, so it's doubled. And a lot of that has well, so to do with just spending kind of, more money, but you're also spending more money, as we just found out last night, to buy property that, by its yeah. very nature, that it's a cleaned up brownfield, it's more expensive. Now, that's money. If you didn't have to buy that more expensive property, you could use that money to provide additional services for your clients. And when we hear that a developer as, as involved, then there's there's a, a perhaps a, a middle person here who's also making some money, and it, to me it just doesn't seem and to be definitely. A uh, way to spend there's definitely dollars. there's definitely a lot of waste there, and the city should find uh, a property that is not that is not contaminated, not on top of a, uh, mm-hmm. a, a former gas station. So yeah, we're yeah. actually we're actually running out of time here because we have another guest coming on, but I just want to tell our listeners that you're listening to. New York City Councilman Steve Levin, who represents the 33rd, the 33rd District in Brooklyn, which includes Williamsburg, Greenpoint, and Brooklyn Heights. And you also listen to uh, Reverend Kevin McCall, who is a well-known community activist and organizer and a good friend of mine. So I want to thank you both for joining us tonight and i um, looking forward to continuing this conversation uh, with you, Councilman uh, Levin. Uh, as the chair of the Welfare Committee in the City Council. We spoke yesterday for a while, and we spoke today. And, uh, Rev. Kevin, thank you for all your support and common-sense approach to things that are happening throughout the city. So I want to thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, Hyman. Thank you, Reverend.
Very nice Thank to talk you. with you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. And uh, we're going to be listening next to, uh, we're going to be joined by attorney Jerry Kremer, who will offer advice on our community's options about this homeless shelter that the mayor wants to um, put in, in Brighton Beach area in our district. But before we go to him, we're going to take a really quick commercial break, and we'll be right back. Welcome back, and you're listening to Chaim on the Radio, 620 on your AM dial. And we're going to have our final guest today, and uh, I am pleased now to welcome Jerry Kremer, uh, a well-known attorney and strategist. Uh, Mr. Kremer was a New York State Assembly member for over 20 years, and he served as chairman of the Powerful Ways and Means Committee for more than 10 years. He is now a partner in the Long Island Law Firm and president of Empire Government Strategies. Needless to say, we are lucky to have Mr. Kramer's wisdom with us tonight, and I know many of our local residents are interested in hearing some of the legal options that are available to them, so let's dive right into it. Good evening. Good evening, Chaim. How are you? Good. It's great to have you with us. And, Thank you. Yeah. So uh, you and I have discussed some of the issues uh, with the shelter already, and how do you think we ought to frame our opposition to, for maximize, uh, maximum input, and what are some of the legal strategies for a situation like this? Well, you know, the city, uh, somehow their shelter program is almost like people who throw darts at a board. You know, they take a map and they decide this is where they want to shelter. And when you think in terms of um, this type of location, the first thing that comes to mind is why would you pick the site of a former gas station as the location for a shelter that's going to impact on the lives of not only the people who live in the shelter but also live in the neighborhood? Uh, I know from years of experience and litigation in various parts of the state that when you have a gas station with underground storage tanks, uh, and the potential of leaks that have happened over the years, and you get what they call a plume, which is the growth of this spill that can come and go uh, far, far distances uh, that no cleanup can eventually cover, then it's clear that the city has created legal exposure for the city and a danger to the community. Uh, I've litigated a case involving 22 gas stations around the uh, state, and there's no question that in many of these instances, the developers and the buyers back away once they find out the depth of the problem that's there. So, you know, you want to pick a location that suits a community, that, that fits in well, that is not a, a health danger to the community. This is not it. So, so you're basing, like, if we have a legal bat- battle against um, against this administration, so you would go with the environmental issue, and that would be, like, on the top of the list. Um, and and that would be something that they would have to do an EIS study. They would have to get, um, um, you know, different agencies involved to actually check the soil. And, and that could be that could be something that, how long would something like this take? Well, they, realistically, they have to bring in engineers. They have to bring in experts who have been involved in oil spills before. Uh, they have to consult with the Department of Environmental Conservation. So conceivably, this could take well into this year uh, and, and wind up being uh, under consideration next year. Uh, another thing, and that is it amazes me that with such a short term time left in, in the mayor's tenure, that they take on these kind of obligations and responsibilities uh, and let, uh, you know, if you will, let a new mayor decide, you know, what's the best location. But on the face of it, this is uh, a bad choice, the s- selection of an environmental hazard, and there's no question in my mind that there's so much liability for whoever touches this thing that it's not worth it for this to be this kind of location for the city to designate. It's a mistake. It's the wrong place. It's the wrong time. And it's not good for the health and welfare of the surrounding community. You know, um, I appreciate uh, I appreciate that response, and that makes me feel a little better now than than before I heard, you know, what, what we have some type of, of solution where we could take some action. Um, I want to discuss with you that this specific shelter is also within 1,000 feet of a school, and it's also near parks and playgrounds, um, and you have children come back and forth, and it's also located 
on a block, which I mentioned early in the radio uh, program, that if you walk two blocks either direction, you end up in three different communities. You can end up in Manhattan Beach, you can end up in Brighton Beach, you can end up in Sheepshead Bay. So is this something that the city needs to take into consideration opposed to having a shelter into one area? Like, for example, um, a shelter that is being built in, let's say, Park Slope or a shelter that's being built in Sunset Park. This specific shelter, it's it's close proximity to three communities, to three different sections of my district. Well, you, you know, this is another challenge, if you will, for the city. The selection of this particular location, uh, number one, the fact that it, it bleeds into these three surrounding areas, we go back to this environmental problem, this plume I'm talking about, which in plain English is the spread of any type of environmental after effects that have been uh, going on for years and years and years. No one knows how far that plume can go. So the idea that this is something that's confined to a to a city block or a half a city block uh, is really uh, like they say narrowing because it's not this is not the type of site selection that makes sense to the three surrounding communities and and now you mentioned the school uh, no one knows how far this type of contamination has gone so you have children in school with drinking water with, if you will, the atmosphere itself. I mean, you know, we have enough of a challenge today uh, keeping our children healthy with COVID-19 still going on. And the concept that the city would take on this kind of responsibility, whether you you had an existing gas station, is just uh, trouble on top of trouble. So, um, so in other words, the impact that this... um because there was a gas station there, the toxic, the fumes, and everything will not only could impact the people that would that would potentially live on that property, but it would also um, cause a health hazard, potentially cause a health hazard to the surrounding communities. In other words, exactly. And you know, a, a plume, a plume that we call knows no geographic boundaries. This could spread in three or four different directions and impact simultaneously on two or three communities at the same time. So the idea that it's just one small location and it was, was a gas station is really understating the fact that this has the potential to cause a lot more damage to a much wider area than the city has even studied. Before they made this particular type of designation, one would have thought that they put a lot more uh, energy and thought into it and investigation. The idea that, well, fine, we'll find a buyer and then we'll just go ahead with the plan just really shows poor judgment. Yeah, and like uh, one of the callers mentioned before, uh, Ida Sanov, um, VHS said that the cleanup will be uh, part of the uh, developer's responsibility. And she brought up a good point, right? And and Steve Levin actually agrees because what happens is is that yes, the developer may go ahead and try to do the, the environmental studies, and then the cost will come back to the city, and the city is going to have to end up reimbursing them. But let's assume they finish with the uh, environmental study. Let's 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 assume they finish the environmental study and they come back. And they say, okay, everything is good. We're going to clean it up. And, and they come back with a report. Now, do we have an option to say, wait, we want to bring our own environmental people before you, you make another move and we want to do our own study? Right. In short, you have the ability, once the city comes up with its study, to bring in your own expert, if you will, and there's plenty of them around who understand the dangers of former gas stations. So uh, that that is uh, your option so that you can challenge the city study. And by the way, there's one thing that's missing here, too. The city is never going to be off the hook because if a property is contaminated, let's say a developer says, you know, I'm going to take the responsibility. Well, when they go after public agencies or private corporations 
for environmental uh, damage, they, 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 they can hold the city still responsible. They can hold the developer. And if there's financing, they can go after the bank and says to the bank, well, you've got a responsibility to be part of a cleanup or a long-term cleanup. So the point is, it not only does the plume spread underneath, but the liability on the surface can extend to just more than a developer. So there's a lot of people before you even get to the risk for the community. Now, does the, would the developer get any type of uh, financial incentive uh, to clean up the the property? Well, there's there's where once again they if they if they started uh, applying to the to the federal government for some type of assistance to do the cleanup here, you're talking about an application that could take a year or a year and a half, and there's no guarantee that they're going to get that kind of relief. The state has a program, too, but I can only tell you that there's a long waiting list of a lot of applicants who want to get help from the state in cleaning up brownfields so that this particular location is not going to have a high priority. So do we have a right um, in a lawsuit to tell the developer, to tell the city, that we don't want you to spend city dollars on uh, on the study or remediating the property but we want you to file all the paperwork to receive an incentive that you said may take a long time. Now, do we have a right to um, to say something to them, to sue them, and is this something that we could actually get done? Well, the the, the answer on the cleanup is it's, it's, we don't we, we don't we're not nearly uh, we're not a party to this who could sue. But the fact of the matter is we'd have every right to tell a developer who may be considering buying this, we just want you to know it's just not going to be that simple, if you will, that you're buying something from the city and taking on the responsibility because we're going to challenge all of the expertise here, too, to show on our end that what you may say that it's going to be cleaned up and it's going to be remediated and we say not so fast, your report really is is not comprehensive enough. Yeah. Um, so again, I just want to ask uh, again that. Um, so, if if there are incentives, so is there any way that we could force the developer by going to those to to try to get those incentives, opposed to saying that we're going to do it on our own and then the city is going to reimburse them for that? Well, the, the the incentives they're the only ones who can apply to it. We can't we can't make them do it. One would think they would want to do it only because it would reduce their costs. But in the meantime, if they are faced with litigation, and the city's faced with litigation, um, you know that, that the most critical thing is going to be the fact that this is potentially a major health hazard to the area, uh, and they're going to have to defend it and, and prove that it's not. And in this day and age, when the environmental agencies are so tough. It's not going to be so easy for them to get approval for this site. Got it. All right, um, Mr. Krem, I want to thank you so much, and uh, we had a very nice conversation uh, this afternoon, and I want to thank you for being on the air, um, and thank you for giving your, your, your professional opinion on how to go about this. And we cannot give up. We need to keep on fighting. So I want to thank you for joining us uh, here live on the air, Mr. Krem. Thank you so much. And I want to compliment you on your efforts. You're doing a great mitzvah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, to all our listeners out there, don't give up the fight. Um, I've been seeing messages, oh, it's a done deal, it's a this, it's a that. They, um, you know, the DHS and CORE and the mayor and everything, it's all set up. It's, it's finished. No, it's not. We're going to keep on fighting. Don't be discouraged by anything you hear because one of the things is, is like when people hear something that is discouraging, they constantly like they feel like, okay, I'm, they feel down and they don't want to do anything else. Let's keep on fighting. Let your voices be heard. Raise your voices. Hold your elected officials accountable. Remember, everyone, you have different uh, levels of government who represent you. You have a congress member, you have a state senator, you have an assembly member, and you have a council member. You have to hold everyone accountable. Elections are coming up. You're going to have new mayoral candidates who are going to be out there. 
hold them accountable. You have different branches of government running for, for office. Hold them accountable. Um, don't think that the only name you know is Chaim Deitch because I'm one person and you need to hold everyone accountable. Um, we have another 11 months left before the next city council member, the next mayor comes in, and this is a fight that this this project may not happen till after I am term limited, but I'm determined to stick to this to make sure that our neighborhoods are protected, whether I'm there or not. We need to keep on fighting. And to all my constituents out there who are on the Zoom meeting last night in the town hall meeting, I want to say one thing, two words, thank you, thank you. And uh, with that being said, I want to wish everyone a happy and healthy and safe weekend. Don't forget, wear your mask, social distance, uh, wear, um, wash your hands, okay? And uh, we need to take it seriously. I have been in quarantine uh, since March. COVID finds you. They find you. So please go out there, be safe, stay safe, keep everyone else safe. Uh, I want to wish everyone a happy weekend, a Shabbat Shalom, until Tonight's broadcast of Chaim on the radio is graciously sponsored by Agra de Pirka, the morning cola for Balabatim across the country. Hi, I'm Michael Fulda. David Coleman. Moshe Garfinkel. My name is Moshe ben Chaviv. I'm an attorney. I've been practicing uh, for close to 30 years, Baruch Hashem. I took early retirement 10 years ago to learn. And I came here to upgrade the period. It is the highlight of the day. In the middle of a business day, I can go and jump in on a shear. Agra de Pirka is a morning cola geared to anyone interested in serious Liman Torah. You can join daily for a Gemara Shear at 9.30 a.m. and other live Shear at 10.30. There are currently 10 locations, including Knesset Base of Victor at 1720 Avenue J in Flatbush, or live via telephone. Present locations include Miami Beach, West Palm Beach, Baltimore, Lakewood, Queens, Borough Park, Muncie, and Flatbush. Starting January 27th, you can also hear Rabbi Khan Shurim via Vimeo, online or phone line, as well as live at 1720 Avenue J in Brooklyn. For more information about Agra de Pirka's Morning Colo, as well as online Shurim, call 212-661-9400. That's 212-661-9400. Or online at agradepirka.org. That's A-G-R-A-D-P-I-R-K-A.org. Take advantage of Agra de Pirka's Colo. Your life will never be the same. Agra de Pirka is a proud sponsor of Chaim on the radio.